to have local control in local communities and and uh, so uh, I think this is a is a good parallel to the to the things he's talking about. So let's just start running here. I, um, my presentation's in three parts. I've got kind of an introductory section, and I've got a medium, a middle section that is kind of the big section, which is into the nuts and bolts on how you would install uh, a, a TV system. And then the last part of it is more on what are the, what are the numbers, right? What's what's the economics of it? So, um, so I. Um, I came to school here in 1969 for three years, and I like to tell people, and I just studied kind of liberal art kind of stuff, and I like to tell people the two classes that have served me the best in my career were in the philosophy department, and it was logic and ethics. And I think they set the foundation for the way I think about the world. So let's give a shout out for the philosophy department. <laughs> okay. So, um, and then when I went back to school in the 40s and got my bachelor's degree, I had to take a math class. I have no math background other than high school, right? Um, I took a class, the easiest class possible, which was the language of math, okay? So the argument is math, math proofs, math formulas are sentences. There's a sentence structure there, and it's just a way of understanding it. So if you can see that, anybody got any ideas what this means? Okay, well, let's run through it. I was hoping no one would understand. <laughs> so these pictures are hard to see in here. Uh, something on the left, something on the right. And let me just kind of run through it. I'll go back there. This is the Milk River a few years ago. Uh, there's the East Gallatin River. And Hard to see these pictures, right? I'm sorry about that. Okay, well, here's some more examples then. Okay, any ideas? More fossil fuels, more climate change. Right. <laughs> so it's a basic premise, right? The more we use fossil fuels, the more the climate's going to change. And that's a premise that's uh, accepted by 98% of all uh, climate scientists. Uh, not only that fossil fuels are doing it, but that it's human beings that are doing it. And uh, other than a few knotheads in the United States, pretty much everybody in the world agrees with that. So then, let's take the whole mess here. So if fossil fuel, increase in fossil fuels causes and the increase in climate change, then the corollary to that would be a decrease in fossil fuels would result in a decrease in climate change. And if, well here you're going to have to scratch a little bit. Renewable energy. Energy conservation is increased and renewable energy is increased we would have a decrease in fossil fuels and then uh, therefore by increasing our conservation and renewable energy efforts uh, we can address the, co the climate change issues. So anyone here who read the, the recent report from the UN, the, the latest scientific uh, report on, on uh, climate change? A little bit there. Um, they do these reports um, periodically, and Professor Running here at the university got a, uh, his share of a, a Nobel Prize for that, that work. Uh, but the deal is that these reports rely on the, the latest science, the latest studies that have been done there. They're, um, in, this report is increasingly grim, and it's a, probably a conservative report. Every time they publish one report, then the next round of research shows that it wasn't as dire as as reality. So um, this is this is re this is real scary stuff if you're paying attention to it and you're really envisioning 
what they're projecting for the world in in the next few decades, right? So that's um, where I want to start. Uh, when I was asked to do this uh, presentation, the first thing that happened is I got kind of depressed, right? Because I've been at this for 40 years, and we know this stuff, and really not much is happening, right? So that's the dilemma, is why, knowing what we know, at least sort of intellectually, or what we could know, why isn't there been enough change to, to address this? We've known this since the 70s, really. Um, so then the question is, what's holding us back? Why, this is a question in my mind, why are we, why have we not uh, shifted gears, done a 180, uh, opened our checkbooks? Why haven't we done the things that we know uh, are necessary? That's, that is kind of a really crucial question. And these are some of the, some of the uh, issue or some of the reasons for that. Uh, we're all self-interested, we're focused on our own lives or on our own families, on our own uh, incomes, on our own projects. Um, there's a lot of inertia in, in, in all of us collectively that we're, 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 we're booked. We're, we're so invested in what we're doing now, it's hard to switch, switch gears and do something else. And it's like they say about the ship in the ocean, it's hard to take a big ocean liner and, and turn it around. It takes time to, to kind of do that. There's a lot of momentum in the system. Another reason is that the crises that happen, the hurricanes that happen, the flooding that happens, the droughts that happen, uh, the, the, the diminishing of the sea ice, um, the forest fires in California or the forest fires in Lolo, they happen in their crises and then they go away. And somehow our minds go back to day to day, right? There's just something about how we, uh, how, how we uh, revert to, to, to normality that uh, gets in the way of us changing. Of course, there's, you know, we've got a worldwide economic system that is focused on consumption, the production and consumption of goods. 70 or 80 percent of the GDP in the United States is based on the consumption of goods, right? That's unbelievable uh, that we, you know, that's what keeps our economy going. The population is on this upward track. So you increase the per capita consumption and then you increase the population and the trajectory just keeps going up and up. And then, of course, I mentioned economics, and then in the United States, there's politics. And I just, I just want to watch, mention kind of one thing. There's one party in, the, in Montana and one party in the United States that is very supportive of renewable energy, and then there's one party that is going to oppose it. That's all I'm going to say, but there's an election coming up, and... Uh, Every one of you and every one of your family members and friends need to go out and vote. That's, everything we do is so embedded in our energy use and, and, and we're on automatic pilot and we don't think about that. So I appreciate that. It's, it's another reminder. So I call this the tyranny of everyday normality, right? We go on with our lives. We're used to it. And, I was shocked one time I learned that we currently, use, on a per capita basis, use twice as much, more than twice as much energy per capita now as we did in the early 1970s when Arrow was started. And I, you know, I'm old enough to know in the early 70s, I know what I was doing. I had plenty to eat, I had plenty of energy to use, uh, they had enough money to live on. I was probably smarter than, than I am now. I mean, life was good, right? And and so even though we're using twice as much energy, uh, it's 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 not necessary for a, for a good life. It's not necessary um, in so many ways. But we just inch by inch by inch by inch because in it, fossil fuels are incredibly powerful and incredibly cheap. We've just Every time there's a problem to be solved, we just throw more energy at it. 
and it's just kind of piled up. We do have this psychological predisposition to equate the present with what's normal, what this is the way life is, and we kind of assume, you know, why don't those other people think the way we do? Because we think we are normal, right? But in reality, what we have here now, normal, is something that has been constructed by a million different decisions that have been made, by a, a million different uh, purchases that we've made. So, um, we, I, 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 I try to think about, you know, we want to try to think about us having will and decision-making uh, ability such that we can reconstruct our present in a better in a better direction. I would also make the claim that a lot of what we have is a sense of helplessness am amongst people uh, that they don't feel like they can be engaged in, in decision making. They don't feel that it, it uh, is of any use to, to vote. It doesn't make any use to get engaged in your uh, community. And, and, and I think that that sense of helplessness serves economic interests that uh, don't worry about what's happening in the future just uh, take your paycheck and make yourself a pleasant life um, and then also coming out of my academic background I've got a master's in European intellectual history and then a master's in architecture uh, but in both those disciplines train a person to think big medium and small and uh, the immediate, the uh, sh sh short term, and then the long term. So it, it helps to be able in your mind to take what's going on here right now and project that out into the future. Or to say, if I did this, what if everybody did this? What would the effect be? So there are some habits of mind that uh, uh, I think we need to kind of rework. We've got myths. We have the myth that, okay, we've got this climate um, problem now. We can just, we can throw a technological solution against that. We can just produce all the solar panels in the world, throw them at it, and that's the only thing we need to do, right? And there are people that very explicitly make that claim. There's a sense of entitlement among most of us that uh, we deserve this. This is normal. You know, even though the rest of the world is starving, you know, we're here, this life's good, and we're just going to kind of continue on doing what we're doing. And then I mentioned thought patterns, um, not only in terms of the scale of things, but we don't make plans. We don't, if we know climate change happening, are we making plans for, uh, not only to avoid climate change, but also to say if if we have a forest fire, if we have a drought or a flood, are we ready to, to cope with that on the, the immediate basis? And then always, is there somebody else out there that should solve this problem? This is a big problem, the government should solve it, right? And I'm here to say, I don't know that the government's going to solve it short term, but every one of us has contributed to this problem and what we can control is our own individual lives. We have our own pocketbooks. We all have our own energy consumption that we use. And so my challenge to you today is that at the end of the day, I want I, I want all of you to kind of think about for the coming year and what, what we can do about it. We can certainly vote and we can participate in the process. You can go make phone calls, you can walk door to door. Um, there's all kinds of community uh, organizations you can participate in. Um, I'm a numbers guy, even though I don't know any math. I'm really good at, at adding and subtracting, multiplying, dividing, and doing percentages. And that's it. But I'm a numbers guy. I don't think we can handle the energy problem unless we know how much we're using, where we're using, uh, how, to, how to remedy that, and then how to track our consumption after that. We need to have a basic level of, of, um, of math skills and we need to put that at use. And then we need to invest in the future, right? Every one of us has some 
disposable income. It may be a hundred bucks, it may be a thousand dollars, and we need to put that to work in the right direction. We need to combat fear. A lot of people in this country is getting more and more fearful, and we're dividing into two camps. And where does, where does fear come from? And the fear typically comes from not knowing who the other is or describing the other in negative terms. So, you know, and this has happened to me a million times where you think, some, you know, you walk into a room and somebody looks a little scary, and then you go up and visit with them and learn about what they're up to. And that familiarity overcomes any sense of fear you have. So I want every one of you to put a solar system up, and I'm sure most of you say, I can't do that. That's, that's too much, you know? And what I'm saying is that by learning about it, becoming familiar with it, uh, you overcome that threshold. So what are we going to do, and how are we going to do it? I'm going to show you right now. How, how much do we need to do? The experts say that we need to reduce our fossil fuel use by 80 to, or 90 percent in the next decade or two to solve this problem. So if you take, and that's kind of based on 2005, most, most people say, so if, we, if you get those numbers, how much electricity did I use, how much gas did I use, how much propane did I use, how much uh, diesel fuel did I use, and then you reduce by this kind of much. I mean, that tells you that's your track. That's what that's your, what you're shooting for. And then how fast should you do it? Let's get started. Okay. That's that's kind of it. So to to, to kind of switch gears and get more uh, real on this. Um, so three years ago, I got talked into putting the solar system on my house. A couple of installers around said, "Yeah, you can do this." They just knew me and knew I was a builder. They said, yeah, you can do this. And then they were gonna, they were gonna get rid of the tax credits. And I said, well, I gotta do this now. So I bit the bullet and, and ordered a system and studied up on it. Uh, and while I was doing it, I, in Livingston, I had a, a workshop on do-it-yourself solar at, at my house. And we talked our way through it. We looked at all the gear. And then um, after that, um, I installed this solar system on the roof. And I'll, I'll go through that step by step by step in terms of what all the parts and pieces are. So um, to start that out then, I just want to start here, right? There's two ways to kill yourself with solar systems. Uh, you can fall off the roof or you can electrocute yourself, all right? So the way you don't fall off a roof is you're very careful and you put a harness on, you put a, you, you, you bolt on a, a clamp on the top of the roof and you use a piece of climbing rope and you tie yourself in so if you do slip, you're not gonna go off the roof, right? So there are some basic safety precautions with that. My roof is very steep, it's, a, it's at a 45 degree angle and I'm an old man and it was, it was scary for me uh, for a long time until I, kind of got my legs underneath So that's one issue. The other issue is the electrocution issue. Um, we're talking 450 volts of power coming out of these panels, and so that will kill you. But that's the, that's the scary part of it. The good part about it is, in my experience, these systems are so foolproof uh, that I, I don't know quite how you would do that. In other words, this system is not activated until all the parts are hooked up correctly. And then there's enough sort of computer censoring in there. And I'll talk about that a little bit more. But um, I felt totally comfortable installing all the electrical connections on this roof. And it's, it is pretty darn simple. And, and if you are not comfortable doing this, then hiring an electrician to do that final hookup is a pretty inexpensive option for you. So I spent, I installed 12 panels, um, and this was three years ago, and it cost me, 50, after the tax credits, cost me a little over $5,000. And so I, after it was done, I, if I was out on the, out on my sidewalk in a neighborhood by, walk by, they'd ask me about it, well, what's all that about? And I, I tell them, well, I spent $5,000 in my, utility bill is, my electrical bill is going to be $4.10 for the rest of my life. 
How many kilowatts is it? It's 3.84. Okay, and that $5,000 has gone down substantially in three years. Okay, so that's where we're at, and it's I would we, there's a bunch of systems in Livingston that have, that have come out of that. So here are two of them. This is my across the alley neighbor there. They they actually hired an installer to do this system. And then across the street, there was another system went on. That was within the first year. Uh, and then uh, this woman's son-in-law and daughter put a system on their house. And then my just now coming up, I think this fall, my neighbor across the street's going to do a system. Um, so that happened, and then this summer, uh, this early summer, um, my brother and his best friend both came to me and said, we want to do solar systems. So they're you know, approaching retirement age, they live out in the country, and they both decided they wanted to do ground out systems. Uh, so we did both those systems, so I'll show you those systems too. And then finally, as an example, uh, we've got a, this building here is the Park County Senior Citizen Center. They've got 24 low-income apartments above it. Uh, they've got a commercial kitchen there. They've got a social hall. Uh, and they, they are like an incredibly active uh, hub in the community. And their budgets are perennial right on the verge. And I think they're spending 10000 a month or something on, on their power. So our group in town, the uh, Yellowstone Bend Citizens Council, decided we wanted to work on that. So we, um, we, we talked to them, they got interested, we found an installer, we started to get, we got some pricing on it, we, we inspected the roof, uh, and then we, we worked out all the financing to pay for this. They didn't have any money to pay for this. So it was a combination of a USB grant, a low interest loan from DEQ, and then we did a bunch of we did a whole bunch of fundraising uh, to pay for the balance. So this past month they went up there. We got all the money together. They got, went up there. Uh, these bottom two pictures. It was snowing, or it had just snowed when they went up there. But they they installed the whole system, and on the first of November we're going to have a ribbon cutting on it. So that's do it yourself or in my mind in the sense that locally we decided to do something we found out what the problems were what needed to be done the task and we addressed all those things and we got a system installed i wouldn't advise any of you to do these big systems but certainly on your own homes all of you all of you are capable of installing a solar system on your roof so what's the process you want to evaluate your current use of energy. How much, you know, take two years of utility bills. How many kilowatt hours are you using per year? And then you go through your house and, and, and identify where you're using that electricity and where you can reduce that. Change out all your light bulbs to LEDs, right? Um, maybe you uh, switch out some of your appliances. Uh, maybe you put a off on and off switch, one of these guys, on your home entertainment center. There's a bunch of ways that you can cut down on the amount of electricity you use. And then you size your solar system to that lower amount. You do a site analysis. Do you have a roof that's pointed in the right direction, that is free of trees, um, uh, that you can put a solar system on. And it, how big is it? How many panels can you put on that roof? And then from there you design a system, you put the order in, you, you pay for it, um, you get the equipment, and then you get your crew together and you put the system in and you're ready to go. So that's the basic steps you go through doing it, and I'll show you this in more detail on this next PowerPoint. Any questions now? Yes. Uh, where where do you purchase your sales? Okay, I've been using a company uh, called WholesaleSolar.com. Their website is totally easy to use, and they're terrific on the phone, and they're happy. They have technical people there to answer any of your questions. Uh, prices seem to be very good. I, I have not shopped around. There may be cheaper places. That I don't uh, I don't know of them, but I'm really 
quite satisfied with them. And I'll show you a few pictures of what their website looks like and what the options are. Does that look like written? I don't know. Let's see. Okay. Can I just put in and say that there's a, a company here in Missoula that does no, solar panels. They're called SATIC. And they're actually going to be speaking later today. SAT or SAD? SATIC. Oh, here we go. The know is that the Public Service Commission is currently considering uh, yeah. whether new systems will have to pay a higher rate because, uh, because Northwestern Energy said, oh, well, the solar people are getting a free ride on our transmission lines and stuff. They should be have to pay a higher rate than other people do. So if you get it in before that happens, you'll be grandfathered in under the old rate, but afterwards, well, Do you know when that's a, happening? And there's a PSC election coming. And there's a PSC election oh. coming. Yeah. Yeah, there's, there's some real economic interests, uh, reasons why you will want to do a system in 2019. And, and the other reason is that there's a 30% federal income tax credit that pays 30% of the cost of the system. That's in 2020, that's starting to go away. So you should go on to it. Okay, so now I'm going to run through in pretty deep detail how I installed this system on my roof, on my house. Um, and so um, I think it's pretty applicable to anybody. So this is a 1914 house, brick house. Uh, we've had 12 years. And when we moved into it, um, it was a cold, leaky place. There was this much insulation in the attic. and kind of that was it, you know, the wind blew through it. Livingston's a pretty windy place. Um, and I think we were around $2,500 a year in utility costs. Um, so uh, I've got a slow methodical retrofit on this building, insulating and air sealing uh, and replacing some, um, some equipment in, in the place. And primarily done all the work myself. Um, so, yeah, always when you're, and, and let me just say this to start out with, before you even think about a solar system, do your conservation measures first. They're, they're much more cost effective and they will, they will help you put in a smaller and less expensive solar system. So, and, and when you're insulating a house, you want to start with the air sealing first. That's very cost effective and it needs to be done before you, uh, before you insulate. So then we, we air sealed, we sealed, the, we insulated the attic, and we insulated the, all of the attic parts. Um, and then after about six years, I finally figured out how to insulate my walls. This particular house has got two brick walls uh, with an airspace in between it. It's an unusual construction type. So how do you how do you get insulation in in there is, was the kind of question, and I finally figured out how to do that. So I those walls went from maybe an R4 R value of four or five to an R value of ten to twelve. So it's, it's still not really well insulated, but but the heat loss has been reduced about. Um, how did so you I, do it? How did I do it? Yeah, quickly. Well, I, I went through every window and door jam and built a, drilled a hole in it, and then we, we did what's called dense packing and blew in the insulation that way. Yeah. Um, insulated the basement walls. Um, I put in the new 95% efficient furnace, most not because it was cost effective, but because I wanted to do, just wanted to learn how to do it. And then I put it in a new hall. I don't get your sense then, too. Um, so I've had about a 60% reduction in space heating, 40% reduction in electrical, and over a 60% reduction in air leakage, right? And I've, uh, I've done all of this on the cheap, right? Um, the 40% reduction in electrical use, I kind of hit, I hit a, a, a plateau, and I couldn't really figure out how I could drop that more and more and more. That was kind of one of the reasons I started thinking about solar. So that's kind of a chart. As I said, I like math, so I, I go to my Excel spreadsheet, and every year, I, I this is space heating now, 
but every year I would put down how much natural gas I was using for space heating and this red dotted line is the trend line and this jaggedy line here is the how cold the winter was. So even though you know some years like this year we had a quite cold winter and so I had a bump, right? But the trend is the trend is certainly there. So that's natural gas, but the same is true for electrical use. And then these are the numbers um, for all my energy conservation measures for space heating. I spent $5,500 in that to do all of that work, um, you know, after tax credit. And this is, I developed another spreadsheet that does a cash flow analysis. and. So what it does is it says, well, this is my current use of electricity or natural gas for space heating, and uh, we know energy costs inflate over time; they get more and more expensive. So I put a factor in for that, and basically what it's saying is, if I did nothing in 20 years, I would have spent fifty thousand dollars. We don't we don't look at that number very very often, uh, and I'll show you that more, and then. And then I said, well, what if, given the, the reductions I've done, that 60% reduction, what's my current cost and how much uh, am I saving? So instead of $50,000 in 20 years, I'll have spent $15,000 or $16,000. So there's a huge savings there in terms of what I've spent on that. And then here I put my construction cost, depending on which year I did it on. And then I just look at the cash flow. What's my out-of-pocket expense? Now sometimes like when you buy a solar system, you've got a big expense in one batch right at the very beginning, and then that's kind of it. In this case, it was intermittent kind of money coming in. But the, 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 what happened though is I was cash flow positive the entire time. Even though I spent $5,000, my my wallet was fuller every year that I did this stuff. And so if you're careful about it and you don't do stuff that doesn't pay back, uh, it's, it's, you know, the cash flow can be very, very positive. So I just wanted to show this example, not because it's about PD, but it's the same thought process and analysis that you would use for a solar system. Uh, and so what I'm saying here is by investing $5,000, I'll have saved 30 some thousand dollars uh, over 20 years. Okay, so now let me transition to electricity, which is, um, which is what PV, solar PV is all about. Now, um, what, what, do you, what do you do there? Well, certainly change out all of your lights in your house, especially the ones that are the biggest lights and the ones you use the most, to LEDs. You're going to reduce uh, that electric use by, I don't know, 80 or 90 percent. Um, your your stove, what, what are you cooking on? Is it an electric stove? Is it a natural gas stove? There's really not too much that you can do there in terms of an appliance. Um, you could certainly, there are some like cooking habits you can change around such that uh, you're more efficient. Uh, a front-loading wash machine is a terrific idea. Uh, because they spin clothes tr much, much, much drier than a top-loading wash machine. And so you have to spend less electricity to dry it than you would with a top-loading machine. Um, and then line drying as much as possible, either inside your house or outside your house. Um, hot water use, uh, in my case, I was using natural gas. I've since converted to electricity. But putting flow restrictors on your showers and on your kitchen sink, um, more efficient wash machines, more efficient dishwashers, all of those things will reduce the amount of hot water that you're using. Did you consider the um, solar hot water? I did. Um, and the trend has been away from doing those. Because it's more efficient just to use electric and use it. Actually, solar hot water, the, the solar thermal hot water is much more efficient than PV, but it's, it's too expensive. So the idea is you would put in a solar PV system, so you have all this electric generation, um, and then get a 
what they call a heat pump hot water heater, which is like a heat pump, like an air conditioner type heat pump. And so every unit of electricity that goes in there, you get two to three units of, of hot water out of it. So that's, that's where the industry is going. Because you can, you got a solar system, you pay this much for it, you can incrementally add a little bit more to it, very inexpensively. So that's kind of the way to do it. What conditions would favor uh, on-demand hot water? Uh, On-demand hot water heaters, the conditions would be that you have a remote location, a remote bathroom, uh, so you don't have to be piping hot water a long distance. They're re they say they're not any more efficient than a tank heater, um, and they're much more complicated and more prone to, to trouble. And I, just, I just wondered, cause like, if you're a single person, and your hot water, you could be going hot water tank, is Water hot, that might be another condition. Yeah. There. Yeah. They, you you do need to change out your electrical service often. They draw a tremendous amount of if they're electrical, they draw a tremendous amount of electricity. So you often have to. I think. I think it's gas. Yeah. Yeah. So what I'm trying to do is I I'm trying to now deal with my natural gas use. I've, I've done, dealt with electricity, so then I switched my hot water to electricity, and now I've still got my gas furnace. So what do I do there? So that's that's what I'm working on. Do, a big elephant in the room is: Are you doing any electric heat? If you've got a lot of base electric baseboards in your house, your electric bill is very very high, and you probably can't put enough solar panels on your roof or in your yard to deal with that, you, and you, you, you can't afford it, right? It's just a very expensive way to heat your house with electricity. It's three times more expensive than natural gas. So the, the transition you would want to make is, is to what's called a, a mini-split mini heat pump, or a ductless mini-split. And these are heat pumps. Um, they're, they're all over Europe, all over Latin America, all over Asia and they're coming to America, you see more and more of them. But they take, again, one unit of electricity and make two to three units of heat out of them. But it's a new type of a furnace, and they do heating and, as well as air conditioning. So if you've got electric baseboards, that would be the direction I would advise going in. So there's my electrical consumption. And there's my year by year by year tracking uh, how much electricity I use. This is this purple line is the first year, and over time it's dropped down. I've had two daughters in the house um, intermittently coming and going through these years, so these numbers are kind of all over the map. But the but the trend certainly is down to the point where we're down here. And then this other I can't really see it, but this other line kind of just goes countervailing to it, and that would be the, pool, the, the solar PV generation line. So what happens with these systems is in the summertime you produce way more than you use, and in the wintertime you don't produce enough. It's just, it's the climate we have. It's just, it's, it's this hard problem that we are still struggling with. And with our net metering system that we got now, we use the utility grid as the bank so that all this excess electricity we generate in the summertime gets used in the wintertime. Basically, how that works. Okay, wintertime we use more electricity, um, shorter days, more lights. Um, so now let me just kind of start step by step by step going through my house. So I did a lot of monitoring on my house. I had a, a, a whole house meter here on this side. And so I could track minute by minute by minute where I was using electricity. So if I, I heated up some water on the stove, boom, there would be a spike on the graph. Or if the furnace kicked on, the blower on the furnace kicked on, I could see that, right? Or if the, my daughters were cold at night in the wintertime and they 
they brought up the electric heater and turned that on the room, I could spot that. And it just was teaching me where I was using energy and, and what were the big uses. Uh, and then I could make decisions about that. This is another little meter. This is like, for instance, I had an old uh, refrigerator with one of those uh, ice maker things in the door. It was a double door thing and it was about 25 years old or more. So I, I put one of these meters on it, I left it on there and it, sure enough that was then you compare that refrigerator to a new refrigerator, um, and it's just a way of kind of tracking appliance use. So I did all of that, um, and over time replaced all the appliances in the house. So that's all of that. Uh, replaced all the lights with CFLs, and now I'm in this process of changing those out to LEDs. And I always start, like the kitchen, the lights are on a lot, so those lights are getting changed, that sort of thing. Okay, so that's the conservation part of it. I, and I knew how much energy each year I was using, and then I knew how what size of a system I would need. Um, and then I needed to do the site analysis. So this is my house, and this is a December 12th day, so just about the, 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 the sun was just about as low as it would, would get. That's um, at noon, and so at noon I'm getting some shading, right? So, um, so I went up on the roof and I used, I went up there with this, uh, Chris Evans had one of these uh, solar pathfinders, and we went around to all the locations on my roof with this thing and found out where the best locations were to put the solar panels. I just, my neighbor has one of the best, biggest deciduous trees in town. I just love <laughs> yeah. that thing, but there it is, you know? And, and then I have one tree out on the street that, that gives me some shading too. So that was what made us decide where to locate the panels on the roof. Um, about that time, I needed to replace the shingles on my roof. And uh, so when they were starting to re-shingle the roof, they had to strip all the old shingles off. And then I, what I did was I drew them a map of the roof and where I wanted to mount. So you've got to mount the solar panels to your roof because the wind blows and you know it's got to be anchored solidly to it. So where you start are with these roof jacks similar to this. There's different types of uh, products out there, but these have to be mounted in a specific location and typically what you do is you run a long lag bolt down through this hole uh, and it has to hit in uh, one of your rafters in your roof. So that's kind of one of the more difficult things you have to do is identify where exactly your rafters are and then snap a line so you get them all in a row and then you then you mount them in. So I've got a, a few things here you can certainly look at if you'd like. And so that's what this map was. It was a map for the roofers uh, to put those roof jacks in the right location. So there we go. Um, a, a roof jack and these long lags and then a cordless drill. Um, so when the roofers were up there, that's what they did. Is they, they put the new paper down uh, and then they drilled their holes and mounted, mounted these roof jacks in, a, in, in straight lines. And then roofed up, put the shingles up all the way around them. So then you end up with a roof which is not going to leak, right? And you can do, you don't need a new roof. You can do it on an existing roof, but if you know you're going to be replacing your roof in the next five years, I would certainly you know, get that done first because otherwise you're going to tear your solar system off to, to fix your roof. So there's that. Um, and then after that's done, the roof was all shingled, um, uh, I went up on the roof. Here's a little section of one of these rails. You can see, you can see the rail here. They come in long lengths. So here's a section of that. You know, once those roof jacks are in, you need a couple of wrenches basically to put put everything up on the roof. That's all you need. It's just sort of bolting things together. That's really the, all there is to it. So here you can see 
this one rail that's put on it, there's a kind of an angle bracket there, um, and, and the thing is bolted together. And then once it's on there, you can kind of straighten it out so that it's right where you want it. Um, and then after that was done, we had to haul the panels up in the roof. Now these panels are, I don't know, 38 by 66 inches. Um, they're kind of, you know, you can see them here, they're kind of big. They weigh about as much as like a half inch sheet of plywood. So for those of us in the construction industry, it's not that big a deal. But um, you certainly two people, you know, if necessary, two people could easily handle them. So we just, you know, hauled them up on the roof, got my friends to help me. Um, the two of us that were up on the roof both had harnesses on and that carabiners and climbing rope up to a up to a lag bolt up on the roof, right? So those of us out on the roof were tied in. So we held them all up to the roof, stacked them up there, and then once they were up there, uh, we could start installing them. What's the ideal angle for the panels at this um, I don't know if I, I don't know if I have that slide in here. I did an analysis of that from from this all the way up to this, and because of the net metering law, it doesn't make much difference at all. And in fact. You find people putting solar systems facing east, and facing west, and at different angles, and the panels have come down so much in price that you can use a location or a direction that is less than optimal uh, and, and just compensate by putting on some more panels. So it, it's added a lot of flexibility uh, to your options. Livingston, it doesn't sit due south. It's it's 30 degrees off due south. So you you either go kind of southwest or, or southeast or southwest. And so you kind of have those two, two options. Okay, so next I want to kind of talk about wiring. Um, this is, you know, once you mount the panels on the roof, that's one thing. That's kind of, okay, here are all the parts. Ka-chum. But then you still have to do this wiring loop. And they make this circuit to connect all of them together. And of course then you say, well that's, some, that's way, way above my head. But it's actually, it's actually much, much easier to do than installing the panels themselves. And um, so these are kind of the steps there. Um, you know, read the directions. Uh, I use this company called Solar Edge for my inverter. And they sell these uh, charge controllers. And so their instruction manuals are terrific. You know, for as a first timer, I I really didn't have to call them up to find out about any of this. So I read the manuals. I drew out a schematic, um, and uh, and just kind of understood how every how everything had to be put together uh, before I started. So I drew these little drawings up. Here are all my panels. I have. Uh, on one roof I have five panels, and on the other roof I have seven panels, and so I had to figure out where all my wires were going. So, Solar Edge has a system. I, I didn't bring a panel with me, but they, for every panel you put up, you bolt on one of these charge controllers underneath each one of these panels. So. Once your rails are up, then, okay, I'm going to put a panel here. You bolt this on underneath it, put the panel on, put the next charge controller on, put the panel on. And then there are these the four wires. What's that? What's the charge controller do? The charge controller does a, a number of things. Um, it, it basically it communicates with your inverter. And um, so the way they have this set up, is even though this solar array can put out 450 volts of power when uh, under full sun, which is highly dangerous, until the inverter says so, this charge controller limits the voltage from each panel to one volt. So my whole array only puts out 12 volts of power until the inverter is turned on. So that's the one thing it does. The other thing it does is that um, I can go on my computer or on my phone 
and I can look at each one of those panels and see what the output is. Is it one panel being shaded or is, is there a ma malfunction somewhere? And it, it talk basically they, it just talks to they talk to each other. And then the, the other maybe more important thing they do is um, the old style of systems were set up in series so you have a whole bunch of panels. And if one of the panels malfunctioned or one of the panels was in the shade, the whole system would go down. It was just a flaw in the system. And so this charge controller allows you to kind of isolate one panel and then the rest of the panels will continue working. So if you're in a situation where you've got any chance of shading, this is definitely the way to go. Now, if you're out in the field and there's no trees around whatsoever, you probably, you don't need to go this direction. So that's what they do. And then, so in terms of connecting all the wiring, you get, you have two wires coming up for your inverter. It's all direct current. So there's a positive and there's a negative. And then on, uh, and then two, two of these wires go to the, to the panel, to the solar panel, and two of these wires connect to your home run. And they're all pre-set up with these positive for these male and female connectors. So basically this is a series where the negative wire comes from your inverter, goes and it just goes through every panel, and then it goes all the way back to your inverter. It's just one kind of one kind of one direction to it. So that's very, very straightforward. So here's kind of a diagram of it, where you've got each got a panel, and uh, you've got a charge controller, and then this little black box here is, uh, this is mounted right on the, on the panel itself in the module it, permanently, and it's just a junction box. But it has a couple of, a couple of, uh, wires coming out of it and you just make these two connections and then you make these two connections here. And then this diagram shows these are the wires that go all the way through the whole system. So I looked at this and then I kind of went back to that and said, oh, okay, well, what's my layout? How am I going to string these wires to make them all connected? So here's my system as I was installing it. First panel was up and I had mounted these charge controllers there and then you just kind of do one by one by one until you get the whole thing installed. These are the little clips that you mount the panels to the rails. So once again it's just a little bolt that sticks up. You put this little keeper on top and then you put the lock washer and the nut on it and you, and you clamp it down. One of the electrical requirements is this whole system on the roof has to be grounded. In other words, you don't want a firefighter up there getting zapped. So you run, you run a ground wire all the way up to your panels and then clamp it, clamp it to your rail and all. And everything up there is kind of metal to metal contact. So then the whole system is, is grounded. I had two roofs, as I said, two different kind of collections of panels and I had a, I had a bring the wires from one to the other, so I ran a piece of conduit over to bring those wires over. And so there we have it. There's the 12 panels I put on my roof. There's the last panel that needs to go up. So that's kind of it for the roof. Now, so now you've got the panels on the roof, and they're all connected together, and then you need to bring those wire, the two wires, the positive and negative wire, plus the grounding wire, down to your inverter. And those wires have to be in conduit if, if, they're, if they're exposed. Now, if they're inside your attic, you don't have to put them in conduit. But, or inside a wall, they don't have to be, but everywhere else. So I ran conduit from my roof down the side wall and then down through my eave and then down to the conduit. That was one of the harder kind of things to do. I used a metal conduit. You can also, there's, and that's a little tough to work with. You got to use a conduit banner, and it's it's a little tricky. But you can also use plastic PVC uh, conduit, and it's uh, it's easier to work with. This is where I made the transition from the wiring up on the roof down through an eave, 
So there's a boot there. You can see the cut, the uh, grounding wire there. And then so that conduit then came down my side wall of my house. You can see the electric meter right there. And you can see the bracket on the wall. So that bracket is where I mounted my inverter. So I I, I put the, I, I you know, it's like you got to measure this stuff and cut it right just so that it all kind of fits together. So this was just kind of the process I went through. And then there's kind of, kind of the whole setup. So the wire, the two wires from the, and the ground from the roof come down this way and they go into this box and they just tell you, okay, stick it in this hole, tighten that screw, stick it in the hole, tighten that screw, bring your grounding wire in and mount it in this hole and tighten that screw. And that's, okay, so that's set up. And then what you need to do, every solar system has a shutoff switch. That's required by the code. Um, it's a, just a safety. The wiring goes into this uh, junction box and then this thing here is a shutoff switch. Yeah, uh, so the wires go through this and then they go up into the inverter and the electricity is changed from DC power to AC power. And it's really good, clean electricity. It's, it's much better electricity than most of what Northwestern has out, out there in the lines. The, um, the sine wave is, is, is very uniform and the voltage is stable. Um, so anyhow, that, that AC power comes out of there, and then it comes around into the shutoff switch, and then comes around into my meter base, and then there's a 40 amp breaker in there. So we can shut this, this, this inverter will shut down anytime there's a malfunction. And there's multiple ways that you can shut it down. You can shut the breaker off in here, you can turn it off here with this, this master shutoff switch. You can turn it off here with this switch. And then there's one more switch here that turns the inverter on. So there's multiple uh, ways to turn the thing off. And then, so when you're working on this system, um, you know, you just have to be very careful to make sure that things are shut off because you will not get any more than 12 volts of electricity from your panels until the whole thing is connected and operational. So, yeah. If, if Northwestern's electricity goes out, is there any way for you to keep using your solar panels? There is, with this system, there is not. In the last year or two, there are now some systems out um, that allow you to have a couple of dedicated, a couple of ways of doing it. One system uh, allows you to put in just a couple of batteries and and use and wire in a couple of dedicated circuits in your house. Like for instance, you might want to make sure your furnace is working, a couple of lights is working, and maybe a place to charge your cell phone at. That kind of thing. So. The, the, you know, with all these floods and tornadoes and whatnot, or hurricanes, they are now starting to s install these systems that have a, s a smaller amount of backup. Uh, you're still connected to the grid, right? right? You are on a daily basis moving electrons back and forth in and out of the grid. So you have to get metering? Yes. Okay. Yes. Because I thought they might charge you delivery even if you don't use electricity. They charge you. Northwestern Energy charges you $4.10 a month. Really? Yeah. Okay. So that's what I pay. So I pay $50 a, a year for the privilege of the, being connected to the grid. They're a big battery for me, and that's, it's a heck of a deal. And they do have a point. I think that's, that's less than their actual cost. But the reality of the matter is nobody knows what their actual cost is. They don't know. Do they have restrictions on uh, in Montana or in Livingston, I guess? Are there restrictions on battery backup systems? Where I moved from, there was the energy company there wouldn't let you put in. No, not that I know. No, they have these hybrid systems now that allow you to be grid connected and have some battery backup. Now, a full battery backup system will double the cost of your system. It's expensive. And 
Um, so what's the direction things are going is to to um, two things. One is these kind of partial hybrid systems with a little bit of backup. If you're in an area where there's uh, fairly frequent outages, you know, you maybe you're in a wind zone or you're up on the end of a line somewhere. We're all electricity in Livingston is quite stable. I think in 12 years we've had the power go out twice for an hour. So I don't worry about it. But there are other places where the power goes out a lot. So you might at that point, and then if, you know, like if you've got something crucial in your house that you really need electricity for, you might consider that. So that's one direction that technology is going. The other direction is having electric car. If you have electric car, um, two things. They're starting to use the batteries in an electric car as your backup. And they're also, um, Solar Edge has got a new inverter out that allows you to super charge your car really, really fast by using a combination of your solar electricity and the grid electricity. So they can charge up, charge up a car in a couple hours. So those are the two kind of directions they're going. So some places they have time of use um, charges. Yeah. yeah. And so they don't want big battery systems there where you might charge up your battery sure, when the power the, is cheap and yeah. then sell it back to the grid when it's uh, expensive. So that's that's that may be where yeah, you have that's, restrictions. So. That, yeah. In every state, it's an argument between the utility and the public service commission, right? About well, only if the state that you're in has a public service commission. I think every state has got some sort if, of. If your electric company is under a PUC, which in Nevada they no longer are, so. There's yeah, there's some strange stuff going on in various states. And I didn't know I didn't know the dynamics of Montana yet. It's, how that works. It's, it, around the country, it's all in flux, right. except in Montana where we're stuck. <laughs> yeah, yes. So, uh, so the solar panels won't work if the electricity is off. Why is that? Is there because the the, the inverter shuts it down. Oh. Okay. They don't, that one of the dangers that the utility company, the firefighter people said was, well, what if the utility utility goes down, maybe a, a tree falls on a line, and, and so they're out there working on your house or fighting a fire, they don't want you, they don't want to get zapped. So it's just a safety factor. So that's the technology we have. So the, that's the question is, how good is your electricity up there? Is it? Do you have many outages? Would be occasionally, and, and can you live through that? You know, do you have a candle? <laughs> you can rebuy a candle, right? Well, and don't open your fridge door. What about water in the cow? I mean, well, there you go. That there are people that put in battery backup because <laughs> because or or they you know there are remote. There's lots, hundreds of remote solar systems that are connected to pumps that, that, that water cows. So maybe you have an in, a small independent solar system just for your watering system. There's a way to do it for sure. That would be crucial. Yeah, about half an hour, Jim. Okay, I'm gonna zip. Okay, so that's the system. So there's the wiring. You know, it's, it's you gotta get the right diameter wire depending on how big your system is. And then it's all got to be connected together. And here's the final connection where we're connecting into our meter base, right? Uh, you got to get electrical permit from the park, uh, from the state. And that's, I'm not sure, either 45 or 75, $70. Uh, so get that ahead of time. Um, and so once your system's installed and all wired, then you call for the inspector to come, he looks it over, sticks the green sticker on it, and then once the green sticker is on it, uh, and some of these other auxiliary um, warning stamps have to be on there, uh, then uh, you can call for the power company to change out the meter. And they have their own net metering request form that you, you have to apply for. So it's all pretty straightforward and easy. And so 
the power company came and he stuck stuck in the new meter, and then kabingo, I was up and running. Okay, so that's it. Uh, there's my system. Um, this is my first utility bill, and if you're on Northwestern, you kind of know this. So this is February of 1915 and February of 1916. I installed the system mid-month, so I've got about a 50% drop in my utility bill. 